a nuclear war caused the destruction of the Earth, a wasteland world full of wonders and violence is about to open up, various mutated creatures make their appearance, adapted from a popular game. In 2024, Amazon Prime's annual sci-fi epic Fallout is released. Inside a luxurious penthouse villa, the homeowner is hosting a birthday party for his daughter. The news about an imminent nuclear war is playing on the television. However, these wealthy individuals are indifferent. They have also invited Elliot Cooper from Marines to give performance to entertain the children. Cooper fulfills the client's requests in order to support his daughter, but he refuses to give a thumbs up in front of the camera. The daughter asks her father why he doesn't give a thumbs up. Cooper explains that there is a rule on the battlefield. If the enemy drops a nuclear bomb, we can measure it by raising our thumbs. If the mushroom cloud is smaller than the thumb, we should run quickly. If it's bigger than the thumb, there's no need to run. After explaining, he continues his work. The next second, a dazzling white light flashes. The little girl extends her thumb and realizes that the mushroom cloud far surpasses her finger. A scorching heat wave sweeps over. The homeowner takes the child and hides underground. Cooper rides a horse with his daughter galloping away. The world is almost annihilated in an instant. 219 years later, inside Shelter 33, built by a technology company, a girl named Lucy is applying for marriage to the community committee. Through her self-introduction, we can learn that people in the shelter live a prosperous life, have diverse hobbies, and not only have any traumas, but can't even be described as happy. After examining Lucy's information, the community committee approved our marriage application. Lucy's father, Hank, is the overseer of Shelter 33. He organized a perfect wedding for Lucy. The father and daughter are unaware of who the groom is, as marriage between close relatives is not allowed. Therefore, every three years, neighboring shelters hold a marriage alliance event. The heavy gate opens before her eyes, and the overseer of Shelter 32 comes for a trade. Their wheat has been affected by a withering disease, causing severe losses to Shelter 32. This marriage trade alliance can help the overseer regain stability, because Hank can exchange seeds and machine parts for an adult breeder. The chosen Monty emerges. He is robust in build and handsome in appearance. Lucy feels a secret joy in her heart. The two quickly become husband and wife in the presence of everyone. Hank takes the stage as the patriarch and gives a speech. They have been living underground for 200 years. According to predictions, radiation on the surface will soon decrease to normal levels. It is possible that the descendants of Lucy and Monty will be able to return to the surface. The future of the shelter shines brightly. But Lucy's brother, Norman, notices some abnormal behavior. Among the residents of Shelter 32, he leaves the wedding scene. He enters Shelter 32. He sees a scene of devastation and gruesome corpses. Norman quickly returns to Shelter 33 to report the incident. At the same time, Lucy also realizes that her husband is acting strangely. She raises her wristband for testing. She discovers that Monty is a raider from the surface. Just a moment ago, they were entwined in each other's arms but now they are fighting for their lives. Lucy draws a kitchen knife to fight back, yet she is stabbed by the opponent. After treating her wound, Lucy quickly goes out to help. The entire Shelter 33 has turned into a hellish place. The Rayers have almost slaughtered her fellow residents. Lucy rushes in to save her brother. Unexpectedly, Monty comes back and attacks again. At a critical moment, their father arrives. He knocks down Monty. He drowns him in a bucket. Right at that moment, Hank receives an alert. The shelter's partition door has been breached. He quickly rushes to the scene with Lucy. The Raiders have captured a large number of residents from Shelter 33. The Raiders threaten Hank to hand over Lucy. Hank naturally refuses to comply. Just as Hank locks Lucy behind the protective door, he is anesthetized and taken away by the Raiders. You look like your mother. Where are you taking him? To the real world. After activating a time bomb, the Raiders leave. Shelter 33 narrowly escapes destruction from the explosion. The next day, everyone begins to repair and clean up. Lucy proposes to form a search team to find her father. While these survivors all want to be in charge, and they have no intention of finding Hank, Lucy realizes the true nature of humanity. With the help of Norman and her cousin, she leaves the shelter and heads to the surface. And so, Lucy officially enters the real world. Above the wasteland, Mark is a new recruit of Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood is a military organization that combines technology and religion. Its predecessor was the US military, 
and scientists stationed in military bases before the war. The organization has always been dedicated to controlling technology in the wasteland. On this day, a group of knights wearing Tmina's 60 power armor returned to their base after completing a mission. Like Mark, a new recruit responsible for cleaning toilets, he has no chance to come into contact with armor. He and his companion, Dane, sneak into the warehouse. They admire the power armor up close. Unexpectedly, someone from above suddenly appears. They even call Dane away. Little did they know she wouldn't be punished for trespassing. She is honored as a squire to the Thaddeus Knights. Mark feels very frustrated. His companions are all going to the wilderness for missions, while he can only stay at the base. Early the next day, Dane suddenly shouts. Someone has put a blade in her boot. Dane's Achilles tendon is severely injured. The superior looks at Mark squatting nearby and decides to take Mark as the new squire. Mark quickly undergoes the initiation ceremony. The scorching letter T is branded on his back. The first mission is assigned. The High Priest of the Federation receives information that a resident of the Enclave has escaped. He carries an object of tremendous potential. This object has the power to destroy our nation, but it can also save our nation. Therefore, the Legion's Knights must search the wasteland to find this target. Sketches with the suspect's appearance are made and distributed to everyone. Unexpectedly, the person turns out to be a bespectacled David, and he has a small dog with him. Mark quickly packs his belongings, set off with the Thaddeus Knights. He looks at the base beneath his feet. He is determined to make a career for himself. Meanwhile, a group of men arrives at the graveyard to search for ghoul. The so-called ghoul are people whose bodies have undergone mutations due to high radiation doses. These are individuals whose bodies have undergone mutations. Some ghouls still retain their sanity. Their brains are the same as those of ordinary people. Besides that, there are also deranged ghouls. The group of men found a rational ghoul, who is none other than Cooper from the beginning of the film. They want to find the bespectacled David who escaped from the Enclave, and then collect a high bounty. However, Cooper has no intention of cooperating. He quickly deals with these people. He kicks the leader into a coffin. Who is the mysterious bespectacled David? He used to work in the behavioral engineering laboratory. All his time was spent studying hunting dogs. The laboratory had explicit regulations to incinerate puppies weigh in less than 280 grams. But David had a soft heart. When registering the weight of puppy CX for 04, he intentionally raised it to the standard line. Instead of handing CX for 04 to someone else for training, he hid and raised it himself. Under David's care, CX-404 grew up healthy. One day, a colleague in the laboratory discovered David's actions and pushed him to the ground. CX-404 wouldn't allow anyone to harm David. It launched and bit the researcher to death. David knew he couldn't stay there, so he took 404 and a black bag with him, escaping from Enclave. Lucy quickly discovered that the ground was barren. Inside a house by the seaside, there were the skeletal remains of a family of three. On the table, there was poison developed by the Sheltertech Corporation. Just imagine how desperate this family must have been to take their child with them to death. In the evening, Lucy was awakened by a series of heavy panting sounds. As soon as she opened her eyes, she saw for hundred and for biting a mutated cockroach to death. The bespectacled David sitting nearby spoke up. It said that the fangs of these mutated cockroaches can chew you into fragments and swallow you. That's why people in the wasteland don't make fires at night. Lucy didn't have any distrust towards people, so she asked David if he knew a woman named Moldaver who kidnapped her father. David didn't answer Lucy's question. Instead, he warned her to quickly return to the shelter. Of course, Lucy wouldn't give up halfway. The next day, Lucy asked an old man for directions. I ain't got weapons for money. It's okay. I just want to ask you for directions. Lucy asked if he had seen a group of people escorting a prisoner. The old man told Lucy to go to Philadelphia and look around. Yet, it's very dangerous there. You'd better stay here and be my wife. I think I'm dying. You wouldn't have to put up with me for too long. On the other side, Mark and Thaddeus were also going to Philadelphia to search. Thaddeus got bored halfway through. Before they even reached their destination, he pulled Mark and jumped out of the helicopter. They were still several kilometers away from Philadelphia. Poor Mark had to walk with Thaddeus. The two of them passed by a cave in the woods, and there, they found cans of meat and David's cloak. The suspect had stayed here. Worth noting is that there were many bones piled up in front of the cave entrance. Thaddeus forced Mark to take the lead and explore the cave. 
There was nothing unusual inside the cave. Just as Mark was about to turn around and report to Thaddeus, he saw a mutated bear standing behind Thaddeus. The terrifying beast bit Thaddeus in one gulp. If he had been wearing armor, his bones would have been shattered. Thaddeus panicked. The mutated bear played with Thaddeus in a frenzy. In the end, Mark killed it. Thaddeus not only didn't appreciate it, but he kept insulting Mark. Yet Thaddeus didn't know that this follower wasn't easy to bully. After Mark killed Thaddeus, he put on the armor he wanted. He tested its performance. And Mark was delighted with the powerful Tminus 60 power armor. Meanwhile, Lucy arrived in Philadelphia. She asked around with her father's photo. Nevertheless, people in the wasteland ignored Lucy's questions. Just then, she saw a grocery store. Lucy walked in and asked the shopkeeper, I see that you have a lot of Sheltertech Corporation's equipment here. I'm sure you have dealings with criminals. Coincidentally, I'm looking for a criminal. Do you know Moldaver? Everyone knows who Moldaver is. Get out of here, Vault Dweller. The old lady looked down upon the wealthy people hiding underground. She drove Lucy out of the store. Just as she stepped out, she ran into David with glasses. This person was very knowledgeable about Shelter 33. Lucy was very curious about David's identity. Right at that moment, the shopkeeper and Cooper came out. They called David Dr. Wilsick. Cooper wanted to capture David and earn a reward. The shopkeeper took the money. She wanted to escort Will out of Philadelphia. <laughs> Plans, I guess. The shopkeeper angrily shouted that whoever caught the ghoul, he would give them a thousand bottle caps. People around started to react to the news, but they all died under the ghoul's gunfire. Right in the midst of their intense fight, Lucy looked through the store's account book. She found Moldaver's name. On the other side, Cooper was about to capture Will. Unexpectedly, 404 pounced on him. He quickly pulled out a dagger and killed him. Lucy couldn't bear to watch. Now, I acknowledge that I'm unfamiliar with your circumstances. But, at first glance, your treatment of this man appears unfair. Unfortunately, the ghoul was not afraid of Lucy's threats at all. At a critical moment, Mark appeared. He protected Lucy and blocked the bullets. The Tminus 60 power armor was almost indestructible. Moreover, the building weapons were formidable. The ghoul couldn't escape. Lucy brought Will into the store. The shopkeeper found a prosthetic limb for him to wear. Then, the shopkeeper asked Lucy to escort Will to meet their client. Lucy was about to refuse, but the shopkeeper said, My client is Moldaver. Will come be your bargaining chip to get close to her? Lucy accepted the task. The shopkeeper entered the coordinates into her device. The two of them set off in the chaos, while Mark, due to his unfamiliarity with the controls, got his foot stuck. Cooper seized the opportunity to turn the tables. He directly destroyed Mark's armor. Mark flew around like a balloon. Finally, he landed near a restroom. Cooper returned to the store. He discovered that Will had already escaped. He looked at 400 and for on the ground and injected him with a serum. Perhaps he could find Will with the help of 404. At that moment, Will couldn't hold on any longer. He took poison. He took out a knife from his bag. He asked Lucy to cut off his own head and then deliver the severed head to Moldaver because the immensely powerful thing was hidden in his skull. After Will finished speaking, he died. He didn't give Lucy any chance to refuse. When Cooper caught up, he only saw a headless corpse. He didn't give up the pursuit. Instead, he took 404 and went to find Will's head. Lucy carried the head and walked hesitantly to be on the safe side. She inserted a tracker into Will's nostril. This way, even if it got lost, she could still locate it. Following the coordinates, she arrived near Hollywood Boulevard. There was a small deer standing by the lake ahead. She approached and played with it. Something unknown in the bushes dragged away the fawn. Lucy immediately pulled out her weapon. The next moment, she was dragged down by a monster. She blindly fired a shot backward. Yet, the wrapped head was snatched by the monster. And in the blink of an eye, it disappeared into the lake. Lucy was about to enter the water. But a gun was pointed at her head from behind. Cooper knocked her down with the butt of his gun. He couldn't find the severed head anywhere. He stepped on the slimy substance at the edge of the lake. He guessed that the head was eaten by the voracious salamander. Cooper lifted Lucy and repeatedly submerged her in the lake water. Hoping to lure out the salamander, the mutated creature took the bait as expected. 
The voracious salamander opened its mouth wide, trying to swallow its prey. Lucy desperately kicked and struggled. Cooper stepped forward to help. As a result, he was thrown away by its tail. Lucy grabbed her backpack and fiercely smashed the monster's head. Finally, she managed to remove one of her legs, 400 and for lunch forward, and bit the salamander's flippers. The salamander, in pain, jumped back into the water. On the other side, Mark was trying to repair the armor. Along the way, Thaddeus communication device received a message from the superiors inquiring about the progress. Mark responded, impersonating Thaddeus. He lied, claiming that the retinue had already died. He needed five bottle caps to repair the armor parts. He sold a tooth to gather enough money for the repairs. Besides that, Mark still needs to be wary of those who have armored ideas. After half a day, he was exhausted, finally driving away those people. A helicopter suddenly flew over his head. Surprisingly, the brother who'd sent another retinue, Mark quickly climbed into the armor to prevent his identity from being exposed. He initially intended to crush the retinue's head to eliminate any future troubles, but the retinue's submissive appearance pleased Mark. On this journey, the retinue brought a new order from the elder priest. It's not just the Brotherhood who is searching for people from the old world. Whoever captures will will be able to rule the wasteland. Therefore, the knight's mission is to eliminate all obstacles. The new retinue sent from above is very clever. After learning that the ghouls are also tracking Will, he immediately traced the radiation traces on the ground. They quickly found Will's headless corpse. Mark guessed that the head was the key. They continued forward following the traces. In Shelter 33 on the other side, they had imprisoned 16 raiders from the surface. Considering the decreasing population in the shelter, the temporary overseer hoped to rehabilitate the prisoners. Norman scoffed, why bother civilizing a bunch of murderers? It's better to just kill them and avenge our fellow people. The shelter had never entertained such violent thoughts before. The crowd showed expressions of surprise. Norman quickly explained. He was just joking. Just then, an employee came to report that the water chip in the shelter had been damaged. The remaining water supply would only enough for us to persist for two months. In the wasteland, Mark and the retinue arrived at the lake where the voracious salamander was located. The detector suddenly went haywire. The retinue speculated that there must be a radiation creature hidden in the lake. Just as the words fell, the voracious salamander charged forward. Mark ordered the retinue to step back. While he stayed behind to deal with the creature, his bullets quickly ran out. The monster lunged at him. Its huge mouth was about to swallow Mark. The retinue shot and hit its chin. The salamander, in pain, rushed towards the shore. It swallowed half of the retinue's body. Mark ran over to save him. He grabbed the retinue's shoulder and pulled him out. The armor exerted its power at this moment. Mark not only dragged the retinue out, but he also pulled out the salamander's esophagus. Lucy's leather shoes and Will's head were spat out onto the shore. In this way, they found the target. Cooper was still unaware of the situation. As he continued moving with Lucy, Cooper and Lucy passed by the medical clinic in the Western District. A man's shouting can't be heard from inside. Cooper asks Lucy to go inside and check. Unexpectedly, there is a ghoul named Roger inside. It seems that Cooper knows him. Roger is gradually losing his sanity. He will probably soon turn into a raging ghoul. Ghouls must take special medication to maintain their sanity. However, the price of this special medication is very high. This is also why Cooper wants to earn the bounty. He pretends to talk about the past with Roger and then smashes his head. Roger becomes a wild beast rather than remaining alive. Cooper tears open Roger's abdomen and gnaws on the flesh of his own kind. This is the survival rule in the wasteland. At first, Lucy wants to struggle, but soon thirst and hunger overcome everything. She can now drink from the dirty water by the roadside. Cooper is about to mock her a few words, when suddenly he starts coughing uncontrollably. Lucy pushes Cooper away and escapes, but there is a pit ahead. She is caught by Cooper again. Angry Lucy bites off a piece of his finger. Cooper immediately draws out his knife and cuts off Lucy's finger. After the fight between the two, a brief period of peace ensues. Cooper arrives in front of the supermarket. He communicates with the medicine supplier through the intercom at the entrance. Exchange one female mint condition. Near mint condition. The medicine supplier requests to inspect the goods. Lucy has just entered the supermarket when Cooper suddenly faints. Inside the supermarket, there is a universal and an international model for robot. It sees that Lucy has a severed finger and guides her to receive medical treatment on the side. The model for robot retrieves a severed finger from a drawer. It skillfully attaches the finger to Lucy's palm using precise techniques. 
This is the first time she has experienced kindness. After leaving the shelter, Lucy thought she was going to be sold as a slave to bad people. No, what a disgusting idea. I'm simply going to harvest your organs. After the robot finished speaking, it administered a sedative injection to her. It pushed Lucy further into the supermarket. Various ghouls were locked in the cabinets on one side. The model for robot approached to bosses, indicating that it had brought the new person. The bosses instructed the robot to quickly dig out valuable items from Lucy's body. The model for robot headed to the operating room. It raised a chainsaw and aimed it at Lucy. Excuse me. Lucy grabbed a defibrillator and clamped it on the saw blade, directly short-circuiting the model for robot's mainframe. She picked up a nearby drain cleaner and then held the model for robot hostage in front of the supermarket bosses. It's a fucking robot. Yeah, you might as well be holding an air conditioner hostage. Lucy raised the model for robot syringe, explaining, I put drain cleaner inside this. This product is highly toxic. The supermarket bosses agree to release Lucy, but Lucy demands the release of all the captives. The two bosses finally open the electronic locks on the cabinets, and the ghouls escaped. Lucy notices that a few more people are still locked up. She asks the bosses to open all the doors. She doesn't know that the remaining cabinets are filled with raging ghouls. These creatures are just like zombies. The boss unexpectedly perished along with the raging ghouls. They sacrificed their lives to protect Lucy. Only one female ghoul remained. She was on the verge of complete mutation. Lucy didn't want to kill, but she understood the rules of this world. At the final moment, she pulled the trigger. Lucy left the supermarket with the medicine. Cooper was lying on the ground, unable to move. Anyone else would have taken the opportunity to kill him. But luckily, Cooper encountered Lucy. She might be influenced by the wasteland world, but she will never lose her principles. Lucy left the medicine behind and departed. After Cooper regained his strength, he rushed into the zero-cost supermarket, and at that moment, he discovered a videotape next to the TV. The man from Dead Horse Town, Cooper played the tape. This is his famous work that he joined Hollywood after retiring. Unexpectedly, the supermarket boss was a fan of Cooper. In Shelter 33 on the other side, Norman didn't give up on punishing the criminals. They massacred all the residents of Shelter 32. I don't know what the people of Vault 32 were up to, but it was anything but innocent. Norman was very puzzled. He attempted to access the records of Shelter 32, but he was denied access. Norman went to find his cousin. The two of them entered the abandoned Shelter 32 together. They crossed through the withered wheat field and entered the control room. Norman examined the wristbands of the corpses and discovered the last detected biological signal was two years ago. If they died before the raiders arrived, then they were already dead. Who was the killer of Shelter 32's residence? The TV nearby was broadcasting news. There was a group of mice living in a mouse utopia. They enjoyed the best resources and living conditions, but eventually overpopulation became an issue. The mice resorted to fighting and competing for the diminishing food. In order to survive, they resorted to cannibalism. Hearing this, both of them felt uneasy. They felt that Shelter 32 was the mouse utopia mentioned on TV. Their speculation was soon confirmed. The bodies on the ground were strangling each other. There was a line of blood written words on the wall. We know the truth. Norman and his cousin continued further inside. They entered the office of the overseer. They saw the former leader tied to a chair. The decaying corpse had a creepy smile. They looked insane. Norman accessed the records using the overseer's computer. He discovered the door of Shelter 32 was open from the outside, but it could only be opened with a pit boy to open the door from the outside. Norman searched for the computer owner. He discovered that the one who opened the door turned out to be his own mother, Rose. No wonder Moldaver knows Lucy. However, Norman didn't suspect his mother because she had died a long time ago. He believed someone must have stolen his mother's pit boy. The two of them arrived at the connection between Shelter 32 and 31. The pile of corpses here had doubled. They should try to enter Shelter 31. His cousin reminded Norman that they should leave. If they stayed away for too long, it would raise suspicion. A woman named Betty had already noticed Norman's recent and abnormal behavior. But Norman didn't stop. He went to access the personnel files across the shelters. He quickly discovered, including his father, all the past overseers of Shelter 33 had been transferred from Shelter 31. The members of Shelter 33 had elected Betty as their new overseer. 
She also came from Shelter 31. Norman shared his suspicions with his cousin. His cousin said there was nothing strange about it. The overseer of Shelter 32 also came from Shelter 31. Because Shelter 31 had more resources, they even had a slogan. It says, when things go wrong, vote for Shelter 31. His cousin's girlfriend also came from Shelter 31. Norman asked what was special about her place. Maybe the mashed potatoes were a little better? That is what my dad used to say. Betty left the residence of Shelter 33 to visit Shelter 32 and were planning to select some people to move there to revitalize Shelter 32. Norman discovered this place had been cleaned up. Not even a drop of blood could be found on the ground. Betty explained, since they were going to reuse Shelter 32, of course they had to clean the place. Norman couldn't help but ask her, where did my mother's pit boy go? Betty said, it's buried together with Rose's body. Your father and I buried them ourselves. After he and his henchmen battled the devouring salamander, they established a strong revolutionary friendship. The henchman even asked Mark to brand him with a T representing Thaddeus to demonstrate his loyalty to the Brotherhood. Mark was deeply moved by his words. He then opened his mask and revealed his true identity. Unexpectedly, the henchman immediately changed his stance and claimed he would expose Mark's false identity. Mark became furious. He planned to kill the henchman to silence him as they fought each other. The henchman pulled out a key. He opened the armor and stole the fusion core. Mark was trapped inside the metal shell. The henchman, carrying Will's hat, prepared to return and claim credit, leaving Mark standing alone in the armor until dawn. At that moment, a large wave of radiation cockroaches appeared. They attempted to breach the joints of the armor. In this critical moment, Lucy appeared. She shot and exploded the cockroaches on the armor with a single shot, crushing their bodies into pulp. Lucy recognized Mark, who had saved her before, considering her previous character. She would have immediately opened the armor to free him. But the current Lucy didn't trust anyone. She was following a tracker on the severed head and happened to pass by. Should meddle in other people's affairs, Lucy suddenly started vomiting. These are typical symptoms of radiation sickness. Mark said, I have right away in my sleeve. If you save me, I'll help you. Otherwise, Lucy will lose consciousness. Both of us will die. Trust me, please. What's your name? I'm Knight Titus. In the end, Lucy helped him open the armor, and Mark would regret not revealing his real name. Lucy regained her strength after injecting the medication. Mark prepared to go after the henchman to retrieve something important. Lucy guessed Mark was also looking for Will's head. Everyone in the wasteland wants it. So Lucy proposed to Mark, I can use the tracker to help you find that head, but in return, the Brotherhood must lend five or six nights to help me find my father. Mark fears the henchman will go back and inform. He agrees to cooperate with Lucy. As they walk, they talk. Unexpectedly, when they pass by a railway track, they encounter two suspicious individuals. They are at a considerable distance, asking if Mark and Lucy have weapons. Mark lies, planning to find an opportunity to kill them. Lucy is very puzzled on the side. We have weapons. Why don't you tell the truth? She suggests. Both sides raise their hands and walk to one side. This way we can ensure that there won't be any friction. As the two groups get closer, the woman on the opposite side shows a fierce look. Almost instantly, the two people and Mark simultaneously raise their guns and shoot. Fortunately, Mark is quicker. He is only shot in the arm. Mark examines the bodies and finds they are members of the demon gang. A gang that enjoys cannibalism. Lucy is very discouraged. If it weren't for finding her father, she never wanted to come to the surface in her entire life. Shortly after, the two arrive at the Sea of Shady Sands. This place is the first capital of the new California Republic. It is said there are supposedly 3,400 people living here after the war. The people here share the same goal as the shelters. They all want to restart civilization in the wasteland. But New California's attempt has completely failed. The city has long since become a ruin. Mark is also a survivor, but he doesn't want to reveal too much to Lucy, because Mark's wound didn't stop bleeding. The two of them arrived at the Hawthorne Medical Laboratory. This place belongs to the Shelter Technology Corporation. Lucy barged in to search for a first aid kit. Mark followed her inside. Lucy instantly disappeared. He pushed open the door to the medical supply warehouse. The next second, he fell into a trap. When the two woke up, they realized they fell into Shelter No. 4. Before the nuclear war occurred, Cooper had served as a spokesperson for Shelter Technology, assisting in promoting Shelter No. 4 model. Shelter No. 4 had a 91-centimeter thick lead shell. 
capable of blocking all radiation from the outside. The technology company selected 80 volunteers to conduct a five-year trial residency experiment. At that time, Cooper briefly talked with a person named Buddhaskins. This person was involved in the promotion of Tmina's 45 power armor. Just joined Shelter Technology in the third quarter, but was very enthusiastic about the Shelter project. He also pointed out, the future of humanity depends on one word, management. Cooper didn't want to listen to Bud's nonsense. He still had to meet with his wife for a celebration of their new movie. The memories of their past good life seemed to be right in front of him. But at this moment, Cooper was lying on the supermarket floor. A group of people claiming to be government officials suddenly emerged and knocked him unconscious. Inside Shelter No. 4, they not only treated Mark, but also sent a ground search team to retrieve Thaddeus' armor. Through the conversation of a few people, it is known most of the residents in Shelter No. 4 are refugees from Shady Sands City. They are not like Lucy, who has been living underground since birth. The woman with long hair asks the two to isolate for a few hours to ensure they don't carry any harmful substances. Lucy let her guard down as soon as she entered the shelter. Little did she know, the isolation room had the words test subject written on it. After a few hours, the two regain their freedom and can move freely within shelter no. For Mark doesn't want to stay for long, but Lucy strictly follows the medical advice to let him rest and recover first. At this moment, a supervisor comes to give instructions. He emphasizes not to approach the 12th floor. He only has one eye and looks very strange. Lucy pays attention and observes. She just realized that the people here are oddly shaped. Although many people have slight mutations due to radiation exposure, Lucy always feels something is off. After talking to the supervisor, she found out that it dislikes surface dwellers. But due to rules set by the previous generation, Shelter No. 4 had no choice but to accept them. Lucy wanted to ask about the 12th floor, but she was kicked out of the office by the administrator. As for Mark, he was curious about the source of energy in the shelter, so he searched around and found a fusion core, and he was about to take it. Suddenly, the woman with long hair came over and assigned a bedroom to Mark. It was a treatment that one wouldn't dare to imagine in the wasteland. After Mark took a hot shower and devoured a whole con of caviar, he forgot all his worries regarding Cooper's past story. Over 200 years ago, he grew tired of the hypocritical Hollywood life and wanted to take his family back to his hometown. Unexpectedly, his wife immediately refused, as she couldn't risk losing her job at the technology company. Otherwise, they would not be able to be assigned to the shelter's accommodation. We've got money. We can buy a spot in the vault. One of the good vaults. Cooper felt puzzled. Are there still shelters that treat people poorly? His wife swallowed the words on her lips. But from here, it can be seen that there is a bigger secret behind the shelter. The shelter no for where Lucy is currently. It might be a bad shelter. After parting ways with his wife, Cooper went to a bar to meet his friend Charlie from the entertainment industry. Charlie has been busy opposing the shelter technology company recently. He strongly advised Cooper not to believe that thus government outsourced the mission of human survival to the shelter technology company. In recent years, the company has made trillions of dollars through doomsday trusts and selling shelters, almost controlling half of America. Charlie asked Cooper if he had ever considered that if peace negotiations were successful, the shelter technology company would suffer heavy losses. Therefore, they would definitely intervene in peace talks between the United States and enemy countries to ensure that doomsday would come. Charlie finished speaking and placed a business card on the table inviting Cooper to attend an organizational meeting. This conversation affected Cooper, and the next day he learned it from his wife, that a new rule was established in the shelter, prohibiting dog ownership. Cooper asked his wife who had made this rule. I mean, what else do you have in store for us? Are the, are the blue jumpsuits? Wife expresses don't worry about the trivial details. Cooper understands that the issue is not about whether to have a dog or not. Someone has arbitrarily set a new rule without discussing it with anyone. This relates to democracy and freedom. His wife was very angry. She said, I work hard so that our family can enter the special shelter, prepared for the management, which can oversee other shelters. This is already the best refuge within the doomsday. From this conversation, it can be seen that the different shelters have varying levels and roles. Cooper was brought before the so-called president of the government, who happened to be his old friend, Sorrel. Despite their friendship, the supermarket falls under Sorrel's jurisdiction. If he doesn't punish Cooper for damaging the supermarket, people will lose confidence in the new government. But with Cooper's strength, 
He can leave whenever he wants. He defeated the guards of the president and took down a portrait from the wall, asking, why did you put up this woman here? That's Moldaver. That's not how I remember her at all. In fact, over 200 years ago, Cooper arrived at the organization introduced by Charlie. He once met Moldaver. Lucy, who was present at the same time, was taken by the surface dwellers of Shelter No. For, to a strange ceremony, they whispered, Mother of Flames, you will save us, to bring back Shady Sands, blood must be shed. Immediately after, everyone hung up a portrait of Moldaver, referred to her as the Mother of Flames. Lucy realized, Mark was not wrong, this place is not suitable for staying long, but Mark had already been bewitched by caviar. Lucy decided to go to the 12th floor first to find the truth. There, she discovered various jars filled with formaldehyde and watched a video of a woman giving birth to a school of fish who were then devoured by small fish. The entire 12th floor was filled with technological cryo chambers, clearly conducting human experiments. Just then, a researcher appeared. Lucy accidentally made a sound, drawing attention to the researcher. The researcher immediately called for backup. Despite Lucy's skills, there were too many enemies, and she was captured by the woman with long hair. Lucy hasn't been harmed for the time being. The overseer and the woman with long hair gave her a videotape. It contains footage of the original residents of Shelter 4. Since then, the indigenous people have been conducting human experiments. However, due to the subject's loss of control, the original overseer of Shelter 4 was devoured by the devouring salamander. The imprisoned subjects overthrew the indigenous people and have been surviving in Shelter 4 for generations. That's why everyone looks strange, because their ancestors were genetically modified. The devouring salamander in the footage is the uncle of the one-eyed overseer's mother. The current residents of level 12 are not subjected to human experiments, but are focused on alleviating their suffering. What was the experiment in 33? Well, there is no experiment. The woman with long hair didn't believe Lucy's words, and she despised the indigenous residents of the shelter. She wanted to teach Lucy a lesson. Mark, who was enjoying himself in the room, saw a group of people escorting Lucy. He put down his popcorn. Lucy was taken to the square, and the overseer raised a large knife. Just when Lucy thought she was going to be killed, the overseer struck at the handcuffs. It turns out their method of execution is to banish the criminals back to the surface. The overseer also provided her with two weeks worth of supplies. Lucy was almost scared to death. Although these people look scary, they are actually kind-hearted. She hoped that the overseer would take in Mark because he really liked this place. Mark stole the fusion core. He wanted to activate the armor and rescue Lucy. Mark rushed over and beat everyone up. Lucy rushed forward to explain the situation. Sorry. Somebody made it check on him. Lucy couldn't destroy an entire community just to save her father. She convinced Mark to return the fusion core. After spending time together, Lucy started to like Mark more and more. She voluntarily suggested that after everything was over, Mark could come to Shelter 33 and live with her. Perhaps Lucy's sincerity touched Mark. He gathered the courage to confess his identity, and he accepted that Lucy would leave like the others. But Lucy didn't turn her back on him, although she had only been in the wasteland for two weeks. She understood that this place could make people abandon their principles. Since Mark could tell the truth, it proved that he wasn't a bad person. The two of them continued their journey. The story takes us back over to 100 years, to the first encounter between Cooper and Moldaver. From their conversation, it can be understood. Moldaver was a scientist at a research company dedicated to developing cold nuclear fusion. Just when success was within reach, Cooper's wife acquired her company. For over a decade, the United States has been trapped in a resource war. Meanwhile, the Shelter Tech Corporation bought up all the inventions that could end the war because those inventions would disrupt their business model. After finishing her explanation, Moldaver handed Cooper a bun. She suggested he put it on his wife. Cooper couldn't resist his curiosity and placed the bun on his wife's wristband. The henchman carried the severed head and moved around, with 400 and for constantly trailing behind. Wanting to snatch it away, the henchman ignored the dog and took a brief rest at the gas station. He took off his shoes to examine his wound. As he had been stepped on by the armor earlier, the henchman's entire left foot had become deformed. He sat down the bulky luggage and only carried the severed head and the fusion core. The henchman also locked for 104 inside an abandoned nuclear cola freezer. He continued on his way. Person claiming to be a doctor caught up with the henchman. 
and claimed to have developed a serum that could cure all diseases. The henchman initially intended to shoot the doctor and take the serum, but the medicine box was filled with bottles. What if he accidentally overdosed and died? The henchman exchanged the fusion core for the serum. Luckily the doctor wasn't lying, his fractured foot unexpectedly healed completely. The henchman asked the doctor where he could find a nearby radio station to contact the base. The doctor responded, you have to go near Shea Sand City. The henchman resumed his journey, and not long after he left, Cooper arrived near the gas station. Cooper had originally planned to go to the observatory to find Mole Beaver, but unexpectedly discovered 404 in the freezer. Cooper traveled with the dog. He had owned a dog before the war, therefore he always had a soft spot for 404. On the other side, the henchman had already borrowed a raid O and successfully contacted the Brotherhood. He was waiting in place for the pickup. Lucy and Mark appeared. The henchman quickly drew his gun and started shooting. Lucy expressed that she had no ill intentions and only wanted to retrieve the severed head. The henchman stepped back and stepped into a trap set by the gray school, getting an arrow through his neck. But strangely, he didn't die, and his wound quickly healed. It turned out the doctor injected the henchman with ghoul toxins. Instead of the serum, the Brotherhood's helicopter had already arrived above them, and the henchman was completely panicked. The Brotherhood wouldn't hesitate to deal with the ghoul. Mark said, give me the head, and I'll figure out a way to hold off the Brotherhood. Mark took the severed head from the henchman and casually grabbed another dead person's head to smash. He planned to deceive the Brotherhood with the fake head and have Lucy bring the real head to find Moldaver and save her father. They agreed to meet at Shelter 33. On the other side, at Shelter 33, someone poisoned the food in the prison cells, resulting in the death of a large number of surface prisoners. Betty didn't pay much attention to it and continued with the relocation task transferring some people to Shelter 32. Norman and his cousin were assigned to different places, and his cousin didn't want to continue searching for the truth. You're a coward. We all are, Norm. But we live in a vault. Since Shelter 32 needs residents, it's necessary to select a supervisor. The girlfriend of Norman's cousin, Faye, being a resident of Shelter 31, unsurprisingly takes on this important responsibility. While everyone is busy with farewells, Norman secretly sneaks into the supervisor's office. He contacts the supervisor of Shelter 30, one using Betty's account, and requests to return to Shelter 31. Shelter 31 sends a message, Have you been exposed? Betty did indeed withhold information, and Norman replies and explains based on Shelter 31's inquiry. As the mission didn't go according to plan, there is a moment of hesitation from the person on the computer's end. But eventually, they open the door to Shelter 31, and they instruct Norman to return as soon as possible. Norman takes a deep breath and walks into the mysterious Shelter 31. A robotic creature connected to a human brain appears, scanning Norman and realizing that he is not Betty. It lifts a syringe needle, intending to attack. Unfortunately, it is too small and lacks intimidation. Norman walks straight toward the main gate. Don't read anything in there, or turn on the lights. Don't you access the info tree, or look at the terminal? The robot explode crazily like a spy, and Norman is just one step away from the truth. On the other side, Mark's fake head fails to deceive the Elder, but he repeatedly assures them that he can lead the Brotherhood to the real head. The Elder initially intended to execute him, but Dane desperately pleads for Mark's life. In the end, the Elder chooses to trust him once, and plans to accompany Mark in finding the real head. The Elder also promises that if this mission succeeds, he is willing to join forces with Mark in establishing a new brotherhood. Together, we will rule the wasteland and become the new masters. On the other side, Lucy has arrived at her destination. It is very different from what she imagined. Almost like a surface-level version of a shelter, everyone is self-sufficient and harmoniously coexisting. Lucy follows the guard to the top floor, where her father, Hank, is locked in a cage. Moldaver and a ghoul are sitting at the dining table. Lucy places the severed head on her plate and demands that Moldaver release her father. Moldaver extracts a substance from Will's brain and asks Lucy if she doesn't want to know what kind of person her father truly is. The timeline goes back over to 100 years when Cooper arrives at his wife's company to ensure the stability of the listening device's signal. At that moment, the company's executives are having a meeting and the story progresses to this point. Norman, Lucy, and Cooper from that time are about to discover the truth behind the shelter. The project's founder, Bud, faced various issues, such as what to do 
if there were people still alive on the surface after a nuclear war. When the people from the shelter sneaked down, they would likely be devoured by them. To address this, but stored enough resources underground to survive for several centuries since. Time is the ultimate predator. They don't need to be stronger than the surface dwellers. They just need to live longer. Living underground for a long time poses its own issues. If you put a group of mice together, over time they will resort to cannibalism. Therefore, but and Cooper's wife came up with a solution. There are over a hundred shelters across the entire United States. During the meeting, the high-ranking officials decided to rule over several shelters each and manage them according to their own ideas. They planned to select the most outstanding descendants and eliminate the surplus population. The high-ranking officials excitedly discussed how to rule. Kids separate parents and children and only the smartest kids reach adult. But intended to establish three interconnected shelters, namely shelters 31 to 33. Shelter 31 was fueled with cryogenic pots where the company's initial management could survive for hundreds of years through cryopreservation. These individuals were the true power core. On the other hand, shelters 32 and 33 were essentially breeding pools. Shelter 31 would act as overseers and conduct selection tests on the two shelters, choosing exceptional individuals to breed with and cultivating a group of super managers. After the surface was cleared, this group of people would rule over the earth. People like Betty and Hand, who are overseers, are actually high-ranking members of the company. But during the meeting, there were shareholders who objected. How can you guarantee that the doomsday will definitely occur? By dropping the bomb ourselves. Cooper was almost overwhelmed by the truth. At that moment, a fan came over to get his autograph. The visitor was none other than Hank from over 200 years ago. Lucy finally learned the true identity of her father. Mole Daver also told her, that her mother had discovered the existence of a civilization on the surface by following some clues, so she took her child and fled there, settling a Shady Sands city. But Hank found them, took the child, and destroyed Shady Sands city. For years, the Shelter Tech Corporation has been eliminating the surface dwellers in this manner. As for what was hidden in Will's brain, it was the cold fusion technology stolen by Shelter Tech Corporation. With this, civilization can be rebuilt, but only the internal personnel know the access code. That's why Moldaver captured Hank, hoping to extract the password from him. Lucy wanted to ask where her mother went, but she slowly turned her head. She saw a necklace around the neck of the ghoul. It turns out that this person, who is nothing but bones, is her mother. She's lying, Lucy. Let's give her the code. Hank knew that if he didn't comply, he would lose his daughter forever. So he decided to surrender the access code. Yet Hank had to remind Lucy that Moldaver was not a savior. At that moment, members of the Brotherhood arrived. A great battle was about to erupt, and the observatory turned into a battlefield. Compared to the people underground in the shelter, how much progress could those on the surface make? At this moment, they were fighting for power or killing their own kind. Each person saw themselves as a savior, but it was precisely because of their beliefs that their world was full of wounds. Lucy was already disappointed in everyone. Shortly after, Cooper stormed into the observatory. Because he had been on the battlefield, he knew there was a vulnerability beneath the armored chest plate. After a frenzy of intense fighting, numerous armored knights fell to the ground. Mark burst into the top floor, smashing the cage where Hank was being held. He wanted to take Lucy and hurry to Shelter 33. He had spent his entire life searching for a home, and now he could finally fulfill his wish. But Lucy told Mark that it was Hank who destroyed Shei Sand City destroying the home he once had. At this moment, Hank took advantage of the chaos and put on the armor. He knocked Mark unconscious. He wanted to persuade Lucy to leave. As a result, he was shot by Cooper from behind. Where's my fucking family? Hank realized that Cooper wouldn't kill him, so he jumped off the observatory to escape. Cooper also knew that Hank would go to find the real mastermind, so he asked Lucy if she wanted to leave together to meet your true creator. The Brotherhood will take care of Mark. If you don't leave now, the Knights will kill you. Lucy killed the mutated mother. She followed Cooper on the journey. When Mark woke up, he realized Lucy had already left. Then, Moldaver rushed out to initiate cold fusion. The next moment, the buildings in the wasteland lit up. Moldaver's wish was fulfilled. As she clutched her wound and took her last breath, the Brotherhood's members arrived swiftly. You killed her. Mark's destiny has diverged from Lucy's. The story of this season concludes here. I haven't been exposed to the original game, 
Speaking solely about the series, its a popular sci-fi genre in recent years, those who aspire to be gods can't become saviors, the story itself lacks significant novelty, it's a typical streaming service production, fortunately it's an Amazon Prime production, so there's no doubt about the quality and visual effects, the aesthetics of cinematography and music are up to par, the portrayal of Mark is excellent, he is neither a hero nor a villain, he is simply a pitiable person born in the end times, he can't be molded into anything by this world. If you like my channel, please subscribe to it.